Well, good morning. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning on behalf of uh, Twilio. I'm a, I'm a huge Jeff Lawson fan. I've been one since we uh, made a seed investment, uh, one of the very first investors in Twilio about uh, five years ago. Uh, I'm thrilled about the Twilio for Good program. It, it really resonates with things I care about uh, very, very deeply. And I wanted to share some thoughts with you today on the theme of both startups and founders uh, giving something back as, 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 part of, uh, as part of their business. So let's see how this goes. Perfect. A little bit of context first. So seated at the keyboard in this photo on the left uh, is me um, at age 15 um, at a summer uh, program uh, that gave me my first hands-on access to computers. Uh, I was extremely fortunate um, to have this kind of early start, uh, particularly in the 1960s when this was uh, totally rare. And it uh, wound up having a huge influence on my life and it was really the basis of my belief that the more we can do to get all young people hands-on experience as early in life as possible with information technology and learning to code, uh, the better it is. And I'll, I'll come back to this. Just one historical note on this. You'll see a big object on the right um, which uh, looks like an oil burner uh, with a hood on it. That is the actual computer itself. It's a first generation uh, two-based machine and the smartphone in your pocket has several million times more processing power than that device, but it was, it was certainly good enough to get started on. But in addition to technology, I grew up with some other influences in the 60s. I went to Woodstock. Um, I was a disc jockey on the radio in college and then professionally, and I was a meditation teacher in the 1970s. So I had an unusual uh, career, and I was interested in my own way at that time in, in how to make the world a, a better place and caught up in the currents of, uh, of that age. But nothing in my life really clicked uh, until my late 20s uh, with the advent of the personal computer because I'd had this early experience. I was a lost soul. And then, actually, the Apple II happened. I didn't put a slide up of it, but that was my first uh, machine, which I fell in love with. Uh, PCs literally changed my life overnight. I went from unemployed to consultant to software developer to entrepreneur. And um, it was amazing. And we take it for granted now, but the, the critical thing at that time was a personal computer was the first time an ordinary individual who was not a technical professional could directly at their fingertips have computational power to do things. It was un, uh, unprecedented. And uh, Lotus 123, the spreadsheet we did was in the, the first wave of productivity applications. Um, another historical note for people who don't know it, it was the thing everybody used before they used Excel. So, and this is in Microsoft, uh, Microsoft DOS. Um, era in the 1980s. But some interesting things about it. Um, I had this idea for a better productivity tool for the IBM personal computer. So my business plan said I'm unwilling to operate in an over-aggressive profit-only style, which is kind of unconventional for a, a business plan. But I knew who I was, and I knew what I cared about, and I felt, even though I had enormous trepidation about putting it out there, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And in fact, Ben Rosen uh, invested in me, uh, maybe despite this statement, but he had, uh, he had faith. And we had a business plan that said we would do three, four million dollars in our, our first year of business. And in fact, our sales in 1983 were 53 million, forecasting error of 1,700%, but fortunately the variance was in a positive direction and then in 1984, 156 million, and I was the, the boy CEO at, at the time. So why am I telling you this? Well, 
I found myself running a very high growth company with a big uh, uh, market cap because we, we took the thing public and I felt like it was an opportunity and also uh, there was responsibility. And what I was interested in doing with the very unexpected success of Lotus was to build the kind of company that people like me would be proud to work at and something where I could bring all of my values, my technical enthusiasm, but also my care and concern about the welfare of others and creating a system that was more inclusive so that even people with oddball career trajectories and histories, disc jockey, meditation teacher, uh, and so on, could really find a place if they were able to, to contribute. And that was the kind of company that we endeavored to create at Lotus. We actually did things like um, have employees rate how well managers put the corporate values into practice, and that helped drive their annual bonus. And that was a pretty radical thing to do. Um, we had an employee diversity committee with real representation from out uh, gays and lesbians, and this was 30 years ago. And so there were a number of firsts in the culture. There were also a number of firsts in the kind of community engagement that uh, we were uh, involved with, and you may be able to see why Jeff might have wanted to have me up here today. Uh, Lotus was the first corporate sponsor of an AIDS walk because in 1984, uh, it was very important to stand up and say that this is a problem that we have to deal with as a society. Um, we endorsed something called the Sullivan Principles, very uh, important at that time in something the business community was doing to help end apartheid in South Africa by refusing to do business there. And we were a major funder of the PBS civil rights documentary, Eyes on the Prize, which is still uh, uh, available in a major uh, uh, testament. So let me tell you what I took away from all that and where I've gone with it. And now come to this particular image, which is a very powerful image from Wikimedia Commons uh, in a minute of a young boy at a segregated uh, drinking fountain. Um, it's not the case that good corporate citizenship is a universal norm. It wasn't the case in the 80s. It's still not the case today. As uh, you heard from Tim O'Reilly, there's a myth that uh, shareholder value is the only thing that really matters and that corporations have no obligation to give back or to do something for the community. And that's a debate that is going on. I don't want to take my time arguing that debate I want to take my time to say the world that I want to live in is the one in which good corporate citizenship is a universal norm. And that means standing up for that and standing up for companies like Twilio that are baking that into their DNA. It's very, very important because the more of us that do that and the better we do that, the more influence the point of view will have that says, um, if you're a corporation, just like any other stakeholder in society, you have certain rights, you have certain privileges, but you have certain responsibilities to give something back. I was very struck by this image when I came across it, and my thought was, you cannot understand Trayvon Martin and what happened in this country recently without knowing the history uh, of the African-American community and the very centuries-long struggle for rights. We are now several decades past the era of mandated legal segregation. We just had the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington and Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. We've moved past that, but we have not moved to a society where everybody genuinely has equal opportunity. And in fact, we have an unprecedented amount of inequality between the top and the bottom, and the top and the bottom pulling further apart from each other. And the stakes are very, very high. And my concern is that those of us who have been successful, 
who work for companies that are becoming very successful, who are part of the tech ecosystem and the innovation economy that is really uh, propelling this country and other countries uh, forward in the 21st century, we really can't afford to go into our little walled gardens of success in a self-congratulatory way with each other. It's important to set an example, to be a leader, and to show the way. If you just take a quick look at how the U.S. is doing, by the way, um, and you look at how they're doing in, in training people in science, technology, engineering, and math, this is a list of the top 20 from a couple years ago. We're not even on the top 20. You have to go all the way down to uh, 52 to find where we performed. In the short term, I think uh, startup companies and companies in the tech economy get around this problem by hiring globally. Uh, but we're not going to H1 be our way out of uh, a talent problem and talent shortage that we are not bringing up the next uh, generation to be uh, full participants in, uh, in the economy. Tremendous amount of wasted talent and terribly unfair. It's the birth lottery. If you are born into an affluent zip code where there are good schools, you have a shot at uh, uh, moving forward. If you're born into a zip code where there are extremely low expectations of kids and rampant crime and uh, uh, poor schools, your chances of actually succeeding, regardless of how much native talent you have, and I believe genius is evenly distributed across the society, is very, very low. Those are the particular issues that I am incredibly passionate about. And it's certainly my hope that some of you are passionate about them as well. But what I really care about is, if this moves you at all, that you identify and find the kinds of issues that you really care about, where you want to make some difference in your life, in your personal life, and in your professional life. So my professional life has evolved a lot. Uh, this is a recent picture of me uh, with uh, my wife, Frida K. Poor Klein, and our dog, Dudley. Uh, outside a building we're redoing in Oakland, which is where, our, uh, where, where we've moved, both office and home. Uh, Frida is uh, my partner. She, she ran uh, the uh, culture and community programs at Lotus back in the day when we were professional colleagues and we became um, a couple in 1996. It's actually not totally different from Tim's story. Interesting, interesting parallel. Um, and she's really uh, helped me rather late in life to uh, activate the social justice component of, of my, my DNA. And that's, uh, that's been very important to me and meaningful to me. But being an analytic kind of person and trained with a technical background, um, I want to know, as I imagine a number of you want to know, well, okay, you say you want to make the world a better place. What do you mean and how do you know what's better? And how do you decide and what's the evidence and how do you think about it? And those are like totally fair questions. Um, so we thought a lot about social impact and cannot at all claim to have universal answers, but because we do a lot of work in investing in, in seed stage startups and funding uh, startup nonprofits, we've thought a lot about social impact as it applies to that set of companies and have concluded that closing the gaps in society is very important. Typically, gaps in access and opportunity between the have mores and the have lesses access to education, because that is the ladder for social mobility, to healthcare, to consumer finance, so that everybody has a fair shot at access to capital and reasonable ways to uh, uh, run their own lives that, for instance, don't depend on payday loans. That if you can do things, and if there are businesses that are closing those gaps, whose success creates not only economic value, but also social value along those lines, that does have positive social impact. And we note further that some communities are systematically further disadvantaged 
on the basis of their race or color, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, and we, we pay particular attention to those. So when we, we go about doing what we're doing and working, working with startups, this, uh, this, is our, uh, this is our lens. We're minding the gap and trying to work with people who are closing gaps, and I think a billion messages for good is a terrific example at um, a significantly larger scale than raw startups of something uh, in exactly that um, dimension. So we have an organization in Oakland called the Cape Horse Center for Social Impact, um, and we both do investing and we do nonprofit work under the same umbrella. And that's an interesting idea because you would ordinarily think, well, what does funding businesses have to do with uh, giving away money? But when the common theme is trying to support uh, programs and startups that are about closing these gaps in society, we find that there's a common set of principle and a common set of, uh, of values that, um, that apply. I just I want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do. Um, we started a college access program uh, called SMASH, Summer Math and Science Honors Academy. This is a young woman at it. Uh, a program for low-income kids uh, from uh, communities, low-income communities of color in the Bay Area and also in Southern California. Three summers, residential, on a college campus, very intensive, a lot of academic uh, preparation, and a lot of work around identifying kids who have the ability to go to a top-notch college but simply are not being prepared for it. 85% of them are first in their family to go to college. And we've been doing this 10 years and have had a um, remarkable track record with kids who've never heard of places like MIT when they come to us at 14, getting into MIT and Stanford and Berkeley and, uh, and Harvard and you name it. And I think you can see the connection here that part of why I became so passionate about this was that I understood the impact of a six-week program when, at age 15 in my own life and putting me on the course in life that I have now. And we want to be able to do the same thing for every kid, regardless of where they come from. And this is Kevin. He's uh, going to be a junior at Stanford now. I love this picture of him in the, in the, in, in the chem lab. Um, we started a program for middle school students uh, in Oakland and Richmond called Smash Prep, because the earlier you start to expose kids to computing information technology and coding, the better. We're actually going to be running a couple of hackathons in October and November, and Twilio folks, we will be in touch with you in Twilio community about recruiting uh, mentors for those events. So, because uh, it's very important for kids to have access to people who are in the business, who can help uh, inspire them, and um, uh, we're I'm just blown away by these uh, sixth to ninth graders. They just do amazing things. And they're going to be building, uh, building apps on tablets in these hackathons, so stay tuned for that. Well, we are all citizens, in my view, of Silicon Valley. And Silicon Valley is, in my mind, more of a concept than simply a geographical location. I mean, it started out as a as a, as a particular geography, but uh, I think of it as kind of the home of the innovation economy, wherever that's taking place, whether it's in, in Palo Alto or South of Market or, or Oakland or Austin, New York or Berlin. Um, that's greater Silicon Valley. Um, it sees itself as a, a meritocracy, where the best entrepreneurs and the best ideas get funded and succeed. And I will say that in many ways, that is true. That is, there is a meritocratic element. There is an openness and a sharing of knowledge and an interest in finding things that work and an appetite to get real things done and to be pragmatic that is incredibly commendable. It still excites me and is really the driver of, uh, of change. But at the same time, I think a more careful view, at least in, in, in my opinion, is that it's not quite 
the complete meritocracy it aspires to be. And you only have to look around the room. Now, look, I'll admit I can't because the lighting can't see who's exactly in this room, so I'm, I'm not being empirical. But in most of the rooms I'm in in Silicon Valley, especially ones with the movers and shakers and the power players, it's still overwhelmingly white, male, and now Asian male, with absolutely everybody else being incredibly um, underrepresented. And there's a new wave of discussions and arguments about why and what to do, and is it a problem, and um, you can't be on Twitter or read TechCrunch without, uh, without seeing this. What I would add is that the lack of diversity and representation I don't think is the result of any kind of conspiracy, any kind of conscious effort to uh, exclude uh, whatsoever. Uh, but I do think that there's a kind of set of self-perpetuating uh, dynamics um, oops, sorry, that, that take place um, where uh, people tend to reflexively look, use heuristics, use shortcuts, have an idea that the next great entrepreneur is maybe is going to look more like Mark Zuckerberg than Trayvon Martin, even though they're both wearing hoodies. Uh, and there's a kind of implicit or hidden bias in favor of replicating what already exists, and more difficulty about recognizing the fact that talent comes in lots of different kinds of packages and may look different. And without taking some specific steps to overcome the kind of unconscious uh, bias and selection processes, we wind up perpetuating a, a, a very uh, un unrepresentative participation. And so there's all sorts of things that actually can be done from that point of view to, to make a difference. One of the things that we're doing, because we're investors, is K uh, Kapor Capital, is trying to do something about the incredibly awful uh, lack of diversity in venture capital. Um, itself, which is actually much worse than, than, than startups, much worse than software developers in terms of being white and Asian male. We work with, these are some of our summer associates there, uh, MBA, top MBA students of color from, that come from a program called Management Leaders for Tomorrow, and it's our own uh, effort every summer. We have a handful of them and give them initial exposure and access uh, to the venture business so that they have some experience and some credibility if they want to go and pursue it as a career. They're not simply on the outside looking in. And that's terribly important. Uh, programs like um, Code 2040 uh, and the Capital, Capital's, Capital Capital Fellows Program Part 2 also place uh, software developers and other technical professionals in uh, uh, tech companies uh, in, in the summer, and Twilio will be knocking on your door about that um, as well, and, 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 and Twilio community. Very, very, very important. So we've rethought kind of what's, what's a startup for, uh, and what do we want to get involved with? Uh, historically, I wish I could say there were more Jeff Lawsons in our portfolio. There are certainly a bunch, if we go back a few years, uh, where there's an inner uh, drive and commitment to build something larger uh, you know, to, to, uh, th than just uh, an economic uh, business. We want to encourage that kind of entrepreneurship. So when we sit now uh, with founders coming in, uh, we ask a different set of questions. Uh, and some people are shocked. Uh, because we'll say, well, are you making the world a better place? And if so, how? And they say, OK, and then how are you going to measure that? How are you going to, what are your metrics going to be? You're going to be managing your funnel, <laughs> if you're doing some sort of you know, uh, website of how many people are coming in, and you're going to be managing your conversions. There are all these great tools. We think that in terms of your social impact, there can be a parallel set of structures, and we work collaboratively with entrepreneurs to figure out what those are. Maybe it's a billion messages for good. I mean, obviously, it varies uh, company by company. We ask, are you leveling the playing field, or are you exacerbating the gaps? And this is an interesting thing, because 
technology is fairly neutral. And here's an area where I would say back 20, 25 years ago when I was co-founding the Electronic Frontier Foundation, maybe a little naive uh, or maybe a little over-focused on the good things that people, many good things, huge number of good things that people would do with the internet, not thinking so much about the fact that it's also the case that every bad thing anybody has ever done on the face of the planet is now being done in and through the internet in some sort of amplified fashion, whether it's human trafficking or just you know, name your favorite crime or, or abomination. Because technology is an amplifier. Uh, and in a, in a narrower sense, when we look, say, at education, lots of people trying to apply uh, uh, doing ed tech startups in the classroom, learning stuff at home, uh, higher education, um, reinventing uh, K-12. We look a lot about, well, how are you going to make this available? What's your distribution? Because if the idea is you're making a product where the sole distribution is to sell to parents, so anxious, affluent parents who are in an arms race to purchase further advantage for their kids to get into a top college. And let's say you've made a really bang up product like some sort of math training thing and you're aimed at that segment. Let's say it really works. And we've seen some of these. And that's your target. You're actually winding up increasing the gaps between the haves and the have-nots because you're giving people who can afford it uh, uh, another weapon in their arsenal. Whereas if you can figure out a way to make the thing available through uh, school systems or to do a Tom's shoes model, in other words, every time you buy one, they give away a free pair, and it's actually a lot easier to do when you have a software company where you're, you know, your, your, your gross margins are a lot, um, a lot better. That can make a, a world of difference. So leveling the playing field or exacerbating the gaps. And we also have conversations a lot about the team and whether the team and the company culture actually reflects the market that it is trying to serve. Because we think lived experience is terribly important. Look, if you're making a product for developers, software developers, it really helps to be a software developer. If you're making a product for uh, uh, kids in schools, knowing that more than half of them are low-income students of color, and your team uh, has no representation from those communities, you're probably missing something. So we, we, further, we further those dialogues. And we wind up finding, and this is the great news, there are many more incredibly talented entrepreneurs out there building great things than you would think. Uh, two examples, recent ones from our portfolio. Plaza Familia is for English language learners in schools. It's the lowest performing group. Nobody had ever built an online curriculum that's fully bilingual, English and Spanish, that's pedagogically terrific and culturally appropriate until these folks came along and are offering this now. And you'll they will become, I can now say, one of the big ed tech success stories um, in terms of serving tens and hundreds of thousands of students and having a great business model that includes giving back. Uh, so a lot of profit sharing and distributions to uh, a variety of good causes baked into their plan. Another investment we just made uh, is, is Regali, which is doing um, uh, remittances uh, over SMS uh, to Latin America. And I, I walked in here and I said, hmm, I don't actually know if they're on top of Twilio, but they will be if they're not. They were in the latest Y Combinator group and they're one of the finalists at, uh, at uh, TechCrunch Disrupt. Um, amazing how relatively backward the act of sending money from here abroad has been. Lots of friction waiting in lines, carrying cash, uh, worrying about getting robbed, lots of overhead. And you could actually all do this safely and securely by SMS. Uh, hard to do, hard to execute, but they've done it. And it's going to be a significant business. And it is going to keep more 
money in the pockets of hardworking people who are not only supporting their families here in the U.S., but supporting them in the Dominican Republic and in Mexico and ultimately all over the whole world. We love these kinds of businesses. And we think that virtually every business can have social impact if it chooses to, some more, some less, uh, but it's not some kind of, for us, nice to have add-on. It's a question of the commitment of the founders uh, and the founding team to think about what kind of business they want to have, what they want to do with this, who it's going to be for, all those questions that we were, uh, that we were asking before. And so we're extremely proud of the founders in our portfolio. You can see Jeff at the, at the lower right. Um, you can see a number of other familiar faces. You see, um, yes, Travis uh, uh, from uh, Uber is uh, upper left, uh, second from the left, upper row. Twilio and Uber have been uh, a couple of our best performing uh, startups. And the, the good news about that is that they're going to, the proceeds from that are not going to buy me a jet. They're going to go fund uh, more social impact. And my words of encouragement to you are find your passion, find what you care about, think about how you want to make a difference this day, tomorrow, next week. Many of you are either founders or will be founders or part of the founding team. You have amazing opportunities to make a difference in the world. Uh, I wanted to share and, and thank you for the opportunity some of my story about you know how we've done it and what I've learned your stories your paths will be different and specific to you and you have my encouragement and support on that journey thank you so much